guru that knows about that novel, I just thought about this title. I thought, well, I might want to Google what War and Peace was about before I go to sign on this War and Peace. Anyway, it was written by a Russian author. His name was Tolstoy. Many of you have probably read it. I tried reading the Wikipedia summary, and I, I just couldn't take it. So I stopped reading it. But anyway, this in no way, am I pulling from that novel and in no way, I don't know if they connect or not. If you've read it, you may know if they connect. But I just felt like this title needed to be War and Peace. So getting into the uh, scripture here, uh, verse 25, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them. So by this point in Jesus' ministry, he's famous. Everybody knows about him, the rich, the poor, the middle class. Everybody knows about Jesus. They've heard the stories. Some believe it, some don't. And by this point, Jesus is walking the streets, and he's got a great multitude with him. You know, that's what verse 25 says. He's got a great multitude with him. So before we talk about the multitude, I think it's important to look and see what Jesus has done at the beginning and middle of this chapter. You know, he starts chapter 14 uh, healing a guy on the Sabbath in a Pharisee's house. That's how chapter 14 starts. Now, to me and you, that might not sound like that big of a deal, but to uh, the religious elite of today, uh, that was a big deal uh, and a bad deal to them. So it's interesting that before we get to this last part of the chapter, that Jesus starts with the, the top of society. You know, at, at this day and time, the Jews living under basically a theocracy, the Pharisees were at the top of the food chain. They were at the top of the society. They were the elite of the elite. Not only were they the most highly regarded members of society, but they were the mediator between God and man. There was no higher position to be held in Jewish society. Jesus started at the top. And when he went to deal with this man in, his, in the Pharisee's house, he was intentionally starting at the top of society and revealing the hypocrisy from the top down. So he starts from the top of society and he heals this man and they are flabbergasted that he does this. This goes against the laws that they've created on top of God's law. This just goes against everything they know and everything they think and everything they believe. And he intentionally did that. He started from the top of society. And then he goes on to the next thing that he does in chapter 14. He talks about the second tier of society. Those people who are wealthy, yet not in maybe that religious elite. Uh, he talks about how you should seek not the seat of honor at a banquet or a gathering. You know, we still got some of that going on today. Everybody wants to be, you know, in the box seats or in the front row seats or whatever it is. It was no different then. Uh, he's telling these people in the second part of the chapter that, you know, the way to succeed, the way to be raised up in the kingdom of God is through humility. It's not through arrogance. It's not through seeking the highest seat of honor. So he goes into the second tier of society and unveils the hypocrisy of them. And then we get into uh, the, uh, the supper that he talks about here, which is uh, kind of a picture of the, uh, the supper to come in Revelation. Uh, but he talks about, he seemingly paints a picture when he talks about the supper. You know, he talks about a master uh, sending his servant to bid all these people to come to the, to the feast. And then all these people at the last minute, he sends his servant out again and says, hey, it's ready, come eat. And all these people start making excuses why they can't come. You know, one of them has to go tend to a yoke ox and has to prove it. Another one just, I think, bought a parcel of land and all this stuff. And all of these worldly things, these people are making excuses, but they can't come to the feast, even though they've already committed to come. So then Jesus, or the master in the story there, he says, Go out in the highways and the byways, find the lame, the sick, the poor, the bottom of society. Those ones that people have cast out. Those people that, that don't matter to the society. Invite them. Bring them in. So coming into this last part of chapter 14, it looks like Jesus has painted a picture that says, <coughs> Rich and affluent are the hypocrisy of society, and I'm here for the poor. That's, that's what it looks like to me when I read that. But right here... He gets into the multitude. He says, And there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So all these poor people are like, Man, Jesus is, you know, he's, he's hating on the people at the top of the chain. You know, but we're, you know, we're the ones getting invited to the banquet. This is awesome, you know. So right here, I think I see Jesus is turning around and saying, you know what? I want all of you to know none of you are righteous. No, not one. 
This is him unveiling the hypocrisy of the multitude, not just the rich, not just the affluent, even all manner of society, from the lowest to the greatest. And I believe that's what Jesus is trying to do here. And I think he intentionally started this chapter and got right here to kind of set up us and think, well, okay, yeah, poor and, and the humble, you know, this is these are the ones that are going to be welcomed into the kingdom. And this is Jesus telling telling them that everybody is subject unto the same teaching that he, that he said earlier in the chapter. So I, I want to talk real quick about the word hate. You know, you may have uh, some people that are um, opponents of the faith, opponents of the Bible, and they try to use this scripture to say that Jesus was advocating hate. That's not what he was doing here. Now, I'm going to use a big word. I don't like to use big words because I don't, I don't think that, you know, that's the way to, to, uh, to do it. But there's something that Jesus uses here, and my wife can tell you more about it. She's a literature teacher. It's a figure of speech. It's called a hyperbole. You know, the scholars call it hyperbolic language. That's a big term. But basically, all that means is, is Jesus was trying to go over the top with saying the word hate and hating your mother and father and sister and brother, yea, your own life also. He was driving home the point that, hey, this thing's serious. He wasn't advocating hate. He wasn't trying to uh, cause division among families. He was just trying to let all these multitudes follow him know, hey, this thing is serious. You know, many of you are following me right now because you, you, want, you want tickets to the ball game. You want to see something awesome. You've heard about these awesome things. You, you want a free show. That's kind of what Jesus is, is trying to, he's, he's conveying a sense of seriousness and he's trying to convey the fact that, hey, this is not just some joyride, this is not just some thing that you can just kind of come and watch when you want to and, and not follow when you don't want to. He's trying to convey a sense of seriousness here. And if you look throughout the Bible, there's, there's hyperboles and hyperbolic language all throughout the Bible, so it's not un, uncommon to see. I was looking this morning at just a kind of a Western or American example of hyperbolic language would be it's raining cats and dogs. You know, we said that in America, if you were to take that to another language or their culture and you were to translate it word for word, literally, they would think Americans had slapped off their mind and many of us have. But you get my point. That's exactly what Jesus is trying to do. He's trying to use an exaggerated language here to convey a very serious point. Now, I've marked down a couple of examples here. Just, just real quickly, I want you to see a couple of other examples about uh, Jesus doing this in the Bible and other places in the Bible where it uses hyperbolic language. So let's see, Matthew 23, 24. It says here, Ye blind guides which strain a gnat and swallow a camel. So obviously they're not really swallowing a camel, they're not really straining a gnat. But what he's trying to say there is uh, you care about the little things, but you miss the big things. You know, he's talking about, again, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and how all these rules. And he's saying, yeah, you're real good about catching people and every little wall they break and every little thing they do, but you're missing big points. So that's just another example of pop and pop language I want you to see. That, that happens all throughout the Bible. So if anybody comes at you and tries to tell you that Jesus is advocating hate right here, you need to explain to them very quickly, no, that's not what he meant. He's trying to convey the seriousness of the gospel and the seriousness of following him. So I want to just touch on that because I didn't want anybody to get tripped up on that right there. All right, so verse 27, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Um, I was looking at this, and like Brother Wiki said, this has kind of been stirring in me for about a month now. Um, but I was talking to my brother Darren on the phone one morning. This was right after the move conference, and I was kind of telling him where I was at, you know. And he said that, I guess the preacher one night in the move conference talked about this verse of Scripture right here. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And Brother Darren said that this guy mentioned, you know, and I'd heard this before, I'd just forgotten it, but a lot of biblical scholars will tell you that they believe there was a very significant event that took place uh, during Jesus' lifetime, probably when he was a young boy. And it was when a group of uh, Jewish zealots <coughs> rose up in Jerusalem and tried to overthrow the Roman occupation of Jerusalem. You know, the same group that Barabbas was a part of later on in the Gospels, this had happened earlier, probably in Jesus' youth, and a big uprising of Jews tried to overthrow the Roman occupation. Well, Rome squashed it, and they did a massive crucifixion of many people all around the city. It was a horrific scene. And 
Jesus knows these people are going to know exactly what he's talking about when he says, bear his cross. That imagery of that horrific scene that had happened in Jesus' youth, surely these people had seen it, these people had heard about it. If they Imagine being a young boy and going into town, and it's just the most horrific scene you can think of, crucifixions all around the city. The Romans were trying to make a point and send fear into the people, and they did that. Uh, and Jesus not only is... Not only is he foreshadowing his death here, dying on the cross, but he, he's again conveying a sense of seriousness to these people. When these people followed him would have immediately known what he's talking about when he said, bear his cross. You know, the Roman crucifixion is the most, one of, if not the most way, way to die. And these people, that was, that was probably the single biggest thing that the Romans used to keep these people, in, you know, under control. So Jesus is striking at the very heart of the fear they have and letting them know, hey, this is a serious thing. You know, that's, that's what he's trying to do here. And, and really what he's saying when he says, hate, you know, all these things in your life, what he's saying is, is I've got to be first. That's what he's saying. I've got to be first. And I wrote down in my notes when I was looking over this, you got to come to him before you can come after him. And I think that's important because... You know, you can have conversations in, you know, in public and, and, and random places and talk with people about, you know, God and they'll, and they'll tell you this. And it, there's a lot of people that think they're they're following in a way that's similar, that's good, that's, you know, but yet they've never come to him and surrender and, and, and giving over, you know. And I think that's important. Sometimes we forget that in this society that there's an order, you know, there's an order with salvation you have to give yourself to him before you can follow him so i wanted to mention that all right flip the page here all right so i wrote down some things just about bearing your cross and you know i've, I've found that getting ready for this for this message that like the littlest things are just like start causing thoughts in my mind today like i was Getting ready to get here, and I saw like a razor sitting on the counter. I was like, "Oh, that might be a message," you know. Like, I, I'm just seeing little things, but I, these may be more powerful for me than they are to you. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention them. Just some thoughts about bearing your cross. Now, first of all, we know the cross is an instrument of death. You know, we try to decorate it a lot, um, and it's beautiful in that it's our the sign of our redemption. Uh, but it was an ugly thing. So here, here's my first thought here. Not only do you have to deal with it. But you have to carry it wherever you go. Uh, second thought. You can't hide it. It's heavy. Every Christian has one. Believe it or not. Last thought here. His cross and even your cross is and always will be a blessing. So I wanted to mention those thoughts. I thought they were pretty good. All right, so I'm going to read verses 28 through 30 here and get into kind of the whole meat of, of, of what I feel like God wants me to, to say today. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. So, first of all, before I get into the meat of this, I, I want to mention something right here. We've all heard people say, it doesn't matter what other people think, right? We've all heard that. And to some extent, that's true. If you're doing God's work, like the fact that I'm, I'm up here, you know, I, I'm not supposed to be worried about what y'all are thinking. I'm supposed to be worried about what God's thinking. In that situation, that statement holds true. It doesn't matter what other people think. But Jesus is telling us right here that it does matter what other people think. Um, Revelation 12, 11 talks about, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Now, who's him? Him in that verse is the devil. He talks about overcoming by the blood of the lamb and the word, the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto death. The second most important thing in this life behind surrender and salvation to Jesus Christ is your testimony. That's the second most important thing in the world. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. That's the second most important thing in this world. And Jesus is telling us right here that it matters what people think. 
He says, Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. So it matters. It matters what people think. And it's not that we live our lives in fear of what people think, but we should guard our testimony as much as we guard our own faith. We should guard our testimony because not only will we, will we be held accountable for what we've done in this life or what we haven't done in this life, you know, there's a judgment to come. There's a judgment for the unbeliever and there's a judgment for the believer. A lot of people don't realize that. Some people think you just get ushered in and everything's great and great and you don't have to answer for anything. That's not true. There's a judgment for the unbeliever. Of course, their destinations aren't set. But the judgment for the believer is at the beam of seat of Christ where we are held accountable for the works that we've done, either good or bad. Uh, in, in the name of Jesus, in the faith. The Bible says that if it's bad works, hay, wood, and stubble, they'll burn up, and, he, and you will suffer loss. If it's good works, you know, gold, silver, precious stone, that you will receive a reward. There's a reward for those who have been faithful and labored in the kingdom of God, and there is a loss for those who have not labored and slothful in the kingdom of God. There will be people in heaven with more crowns than others. There will be people in heaven with more rewards than others. There is a judgment for the unbeliever and for the believer. And I want you to know that today, that it matters what you do in the faith. It matters what your testimony says. It matters what people think about you. It matters where you go, what you say, where you don't go, what you don't say. It matters. And I think that's a big problem in our society. I think that the gospel, to some degree, has gotten watered down to the point where it's like either you got an invitation or you didn't. You got an invitation, I'm good to go. I can just, you know, sit back, prop my feet up. Everything's fine, but it matters. It matters. So not only will we be held accountable for what we've done, but we'll be held accountable for how we have influenced other people. Have we been a stumbling block or have we been a blessing? That's why you hear, you know, my brother Austin Lindsay, I'm, I'm so blessed to get to hang out with him every day. You know, I can always count on Austin and say, speak life. You know, and I love that because, you know, we can talk about the word all day long. You know, but sometimes when you get a little negative, you get into some of the nitty gritty of it. And Austin will be quick to remind us, so speak life, you know. And I think that's so good. Uh, but I just wanted to paint the picture that it matters what your testimony says. It matters what you do. So I want to paint that picture for you real quick. And then going back to verse 28 here, you know, I, I've made this joke many times. I know I've told Brother Blair because he's helped me out in my treehouse. I don't know if y'all heard about my treehouse. If you've been through Meadowbrook, you've probably seen it. I think I'm breaking some, some codes or something. I'm not sure. But I didn't really ask before I got into it. <laughs> but anyway, that treehouse has been a, a thorn in my side. And, and it's been going on now for about two and a half, I mean, maybe three years. That may be, I may have hit the three-year mark. Some wood, is, some wood on it is older than others. Um, you know, I try to get to it when I can, but that's just, that's just, that's just what's happened. So I always think about this passage, these verses, when I think about that treehouse. And I've even joked with Blair and other people, you know, I feel like that. That man who started building the house and didn't count the cost and didn't finish it, you know, and I always laugh about that. And I mean, it's really not funny, but I have to laugh about it because every time I leave that treehouse, it's laughing at me. So I have to laugh about it. But anyway, I've always kind of, and I've heard this talk, when you read it at face value, you know, that's what I get from it, that's what you get from it. And usually the way you hear this preached and you, you hear this talked about is, you know, if I could summarize a teaching of, of 28 through 30, they would say, you know, uh, count, the, count the cost of living this Christian life. You need to decide if you've got what it takes to finish the race, finish the course. You know, count the cost of this Christian life. Can you do it? Can you as a Christian endure to the end? You know, count the cost. That, that's what you hear preached, okay? And, and I believe that. And I, and I believe that. And that, that teaching means a lot to me and it's helped me a lot in the past. Um, but today, I really feel like Jesus is trying to say even more than that, a little something different than that today. So I want to get into that. Um, I'm going to go ahead on and uh, I want you to think about those verses 28 through 30 while I read 31 through 33 here. Or well, what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first? And consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand. Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. 
So I believe Jesus is telling us to count the cost of building your life without Him. You know, you always hear this talk about, about the believer counting the cost of following Jesus. I think Jesus is trying to tell us today to count the cost of building our life without Him. You know, uh, you hear people... You hear people say, you know, I, I'm t teaching the hospitals. So I hear people say, this is my life. You know, I can just see some fingers snapping whenever they say that. You know, this is my life. You know, you hear people say that all the time. And really, that's at the root of the, the entire problem. Um, but you hear people say that, this is my life. You know, I, I can do what I want to. You know, or like, and we say, I can do it by myself. You know, you hear that. But that that's the mentality that all of us kind of are born with. That's the mentality that we have. You know, this is my life. I'm the king of my life. That's essentially what you're saying. You know, I heard Brother Mickey say a couple couple sermons ago. I can't remember who the preacher was that said it, but there, in every heart, there's a throne. You know, in every heart, there's a throne. It's just a matter of who's sitting on the throne of your heart. But if you go back and you look at 1 Chronicles 21, 1 through 7, or kind of just that, that chapter, 1 Chronicles 21, what you'll see is where David numbered Israel. And everybody's... A lot of people have heard about that. You know, David numbered Israel. You know, um, David was such a godly man. When he made mistakes like that, they were so vivid in contrast to who he is and who he was. <clears throat> so in that, in that chapter in 1 Chronicles 21, David numbered Israel. Now, the reason why that was a sin in 1 Chronicles 21 is because David already belonged to God. Um, he was anointed by God. He, was, he belonged to God. And instead of trusting God to bring him victory in the battle, he took it on himself to number his Israel, to number the people in Israel, and to try and see if he had enough within himself to win this battle. Now, he was trusting in himself. That's why it was a sin. That's why all of that story happened. That's why that, you know, David sinned against God. That was the sin, was that he trusted his own resources instead of trusting God. But I believe today that God is telling us to number our Israel. And you say, well, David did it. It was a sin. I believe God is telling us today to number our Israel, our life, our resources, and see and realize that we don't have enough. We don't have enough resources to build this house, to build this tree house. To build this life. To make it to the end. We don't have enough. And I think that's what God wants to tell us today. Think about your life. Think about everything that has been put in your sphere of influence and your authority and your you know, finances. All of that. If you don't belong to Jesus. If you've yet to surrender your life to Jesus. I want you to think about that. Do you have enough? Do you have what it takes if you look in verses 31 through 35, it's about a war. So I'm going to tie all this together. You think you're fighting against the world and against each other. But let me tell you who you're really fighting. You're fighting God. And that may seem like a shock to you. You're at war with God if you don't belong to God. You're at war with God. And you say, can that really be true? Can I, can I really be at war with God? Can that really be true? Let me read these verses to you right here. James 4.4 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Romans 5.10 For if, we, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. So there's other verses that we can go to, but it's a hard truth to realize that you're either for Him, you're either with Him, or you're against Him. If you don't belong to God, then you are at war with God. You're either at war with God and at peace with the world, or you're at war with the world and you're at peace with God. That's the only two options. So, I want you to notice too, in, 
in verse 31. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Notice who's making war. It's not God. It's us. We're the ones that made war with God. So you can think about God as sitting on his throne and being mad at you and sending lightning bolts down, but we're the ones that rebelled against God. Notice that. God did not make war with us. We made war with God. I think that's important. So you say, well, that's kind of messed up. I thought God loved everybody. Well, notice in verse 31. Again, going to make war with God. God didn't make war with us. We made war with God. So God in this story that Jesus is telling. He's the king with 20,000 men. And we're the king with 10,000 men. We're going to make war against a greater king. And that's what we do. That's what we're doing. That's what we do in this life. We're, going, we're making war against the greater king. Let me read these verses to you right here. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the first one. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So verse after verse reminding us that it's us who have come astray. That it's us who have started this war. It's us who have chosen to rebel against God and to start this war against God. So what's the solution? If you look in verses 32 and 33, the phrase, desire of conditions of peace, is what stands out. The king with 10,000 men made war with the king with 20,000 men, but then realized he couldn't win. He would soon be destroyed. His only hope was to make peace with the greater king. We are the lesser king. And God, through his goodness and his desire that we are saved from the coming carnage and destruction, is convicting us through his messenger, the Holy Spirit. He's saying, make peace with me. That's God's plea. If I can sum up this entire Bible right here in one word, all right, a lot of words may come to your mind, but if I can sum this up, I don't believe this is accurate. Reconciliation. That is the message of this book. Yes, love is the message. Yes, forgiveness is the message. But all of those are made possible by God's desire for reconciliation. What is reconciliation? That seems like a big word. To be reconciled is to be made right, for things to be put back in order, for the relationship to be restored. Restoration would be a synonym of reconciliation. The entire plan of God is laid out from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. It's all about getting us back. It's all about reconciling man to God and man to man. That's what the entire book's about. If you want a summary of the Bible, that's the summary. God wants to reconcile us to Him. He wants to save and bring back that which was lost. If we're lost, we, you know, He wants us to be found. He wants us to be reconciled unto Him. He wants us to be reconciled to each other. You know, Paul said in one of his epistles, he said, we have been given the, the ministry of reconciliation. That's what this whole thing is about. It's about being, he says, be ye reconciled to God and be ye reconciled to each other. You know, that's what this whole thing's about. So I just wanted to make mention of that word because I believe that would be a good word to summarize the entire Bible. All right, so think about this. What earthly king do you know who having tons of power, tons of money, endless resources, and a lesser king makes war with him, and yet 
He's willing to make peace. What, what incentive does an earthly king have to make peace with somebody who made war with him and who can't even hold a candle to the power and mind of the greater king? It goes against the entire way of, of human thought. You know, I mean, why would a greater king who has the ability to squash this other king, why would, why would he make peace? What's in it for him? You know, there, it doesn't make earthly sense. But realize that God owning everything, creating everything, having all power, all authority, all dominion, only, you know, as Brother David always says, the cattle on a thousand hills, he owns it all. Why would he make peace with us when we're the ones that made war with him? It's all about reconciliation. It's all about God restoring us to him so that we can have a relationship with him and he can have a relationship with us. That's what the whole thing's about. So, the world doesn't want you to know about the coming carnage. And if you hear about it, it doesn't want you to understand God's solution. So, these last few verses right here, verses 34 and 35, these are for ecclesia, the, the Greek word for church. These are, these are for those who are the called out of God. That's what these last couple of verses are for, for right here. So, real quick, I just want to talk about salt. Why is salt good? It preserves meat and other foods. Helps melt ice. I thought that was good. Uh, it's needed to balance the soil. And it helps control weeds. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just bring my closing thought here. And then I want to mention one other brief thing. And then, and then I'll wrap it up. If you and I cease to preserve the goodness and holiness of God in our lives. And the lives of people God has put in our path. If we cease to bring love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and hope to the world. If we cease to melt the coldness and cruelty of this world. If we cease to be used to prevent and control the weeds of ungodliness <coughs> that are trying to grow, then we essentially become useless to God. I want to ask you this question, and I, my prayer is that this question burns in you. I pray that this entire day you cannot forget this question. So if you haven't heard anything else that I've said, I want you to listen right now. Think about this question. I want, I want you to go to bed thinking about this question. I want to wake you up in the middle of the night. What do you want? What do you want? If, if nobody else is around you and you're thinking, think to yourself, what do I want? It's okay if, if you thought about a new car, there's maybe some 15-year-olds, I don't know, there's anybody. Just be honest with yourself. What do you want? Do you want liberty or slavery? Do you want forgiveness or condemnation? Do you want joy or do you want sorrow? Do you want peace or do you want war? Let me tell you what I want. I want everything God's got to give me. I want, I want to see some crazy stuff happen. You know, Austin, as they talk about all the time, you know, we, we think to ourselves, well, all those miracles and all that stuff in, in the Bible, that can't happen now. I want that. I want my children to follow Jesus. I want my family to live for the Lord. I want the provision, the guidance, the direction, the anointing of God in my life. That's what I want. You know, Jesus says... Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. He says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I want you to ask yourself, what do you want? And the second thing I want you to ask yourself is, are you willing to pay the price for it? Are you willing to pay the price to get what you want? If it is the peaceable fruit of righteousness? Are you willing to labor for the Lord and put in time? Because the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that all labor yields profit. That makes me feel good. That means that anything that we do, that we labor for, both in the physical and in the spiritual, will yield profit. All labor yields profit. 
So are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to put in what it takes to get what you want? What do you want? Because you got to make up your mind what you want. That's just the bottom line. What do you want? I love you. God bless you. Thank you for having me.